Welcome back to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 103. This is all about beginning band, and I'm here with Lori Zentz. Lori Zentz teaches at Freedom Crossing Academy in Florida, and I've met Lori recently through her husband, Don, who's been up here in Maine a couple times doing All States with us, and she and I have been communicating a lot. Um, Lori has a presentation that she has done with a lot of local beginning band directors that um, they've gotten a ton out of. So we're very blessed today to have Lori with us to help us all um, improve at teaching beginning band. And I'll say, if you don't teach beginning band, please send this video to somebody in your district who does teach beginning band. Lori, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm awesome. Thanks for being here. Thank you for letting me talk about something that I'm very passionate about. You know, isn't it crazy when you're in a district where the kids get started right? Oh man, it's like, it's it, everybody's job is just so much easier. And then if you're in a district, that's the opposite hard. Yeah. It's, it's the whole thing. It's so vitally important. You cannot just downplay and dismiss it. It takes most of my energy really. Yeah. So which grades do you teach? I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth here in Florida. For the most part, we start in sixth grade. I know up North, it's a lot younger, but, um, sixth grade beginners is the norm. Mm Mm-hmm. And we have, we have middle school. So high schools are nine through 12, basically. Sure. Um, so the big concept is that, let's see, it's called a system for getting to the music faster with strong fundamentals and that you start beginning band without a method book. Right. So the question, question I'm going to have is why and what led you over your years of teaching to this approach? Well, it's nothing new. Uh, People have been talking about this being great pedagogy from the beginning of time, but um, I've kind of developed a little process. I really was a better band director after being an elementary music teacher for 20 years. So life takes some turns. And when we moved to Florida, there was no band job open. So I ended up teaching elementary got ORF certified. I have three levels of ORF certification. And I started really loving the process of ORF. It's such a masterful teaching process. And um, I stopped confusing kids at that point. And things started going so beautifully on improv. It's ORF is a by rote approach anyway, Mm -hmm. and um, improvisation based approach and all of that. So that when uh, life took a turn again and I went back to teaching band, it I was a totally different band director than I had been at the beginning because of this. So I like to use sound before symbol mm-hmm. just because that's the way people learn. And then I, you, it's very ear-based. So a lot of echo me, echo me, listen to this. What do you hear? You have to train their ears before their eyes are all engrossed in the black and white Mm -hmm. and get them being musically cognizant before they are attached to, to uh, the written music. And it's also important. I learned from teaching elementary music that you have to isolate the concepts out. If you don't, it's total confusion, but Mm -hmm. if you do and and make sure that they understand the concepts before you thread them back together, you're going to have a whole lot more success. And another thing I learned from teaching elementary, don't go too fast. Nope. There's no reason to rush, rush, rush to get all the notes in a full scale and the whole chromatic scale and get to page 27. No, this is about really having your finger on the pulse of what the kids are getting and slow down when they need it, speed up when they mm-hmm. need it. And then um, after they're they're playing away freely uh, on their instrument with these this uh, small group of notes, then you start introducing the written. You know, band band is confusing it the transposition of the instruments. Mm-hmm. When I was teaching ORF, ORF instruments are all in the key of C. Recorders, uh, you play in the key of C, you play in the key of G, but everybody's playing the same thing. But band, it gets really confusing when you start throwing concert this, concert that, and throwing all the pitches around and the kids don't understand why the kid next to him is playing an E. Well, he's playing a D, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
the, the method that I came up with using numbers, just using the numbers like music theory uh, in college, I was, my music theory was done with the numbers instead of the solfege. But by using that, the kids can really make some progress because they were counting numbers before they ever got to school. Sure. One of the first things that kids, that parents do with their kids is teach them to count or, uh, you know, count items and, and all of that. So they're very familiar with numbers from a very, very young age. Yeah. And I'm um, looking forward. Basically, this whole session is going to be basically how you do beginning band. Um, so we're going to get a lot of those things you, you hit at. We're going to, we're going to hit today. A couple questions for you. Um, I think a lot of people see other schools and people who've done this and do it well, and they assume that they can't take stuff because their school isn't the same as the school that this person teaches in. So I, I want to tell people listening that even if your setup is different from what Lori has, that you can still get a lot out of the concepts we're going to learn. And even if you take one concept and use it in your band, they're going to be a better band for it. So a couple yeah. questions for you. Um, instrument groupings. How are your classes grouped? Well, for beginning band, when they sign up for band, they're scheduled. So I don't know what they're playing yet. So I teach all 14 things in one room. Okay. And typically my classes are 30 to 45 kids. Okay. And how long are your classes? 42 minutes, something like that. And you said, five, you mentioned to me five days a week, right? Yes. It's a class yeah. in their middle school schedule. So I'm going to be curious as we go through, if there's anything that hits in your mind about like, I do it this way, but if I had them maybe two days a week, how might I do it the same or different or whatever, you know, cause a lot of people well, listening might not have the same schedule. I have done this on block schedule as well. Right. At my previous school, we had uh, 90 minute blocks every. So it worked out to be two days a week, some weeks, three days a week, some weeks. But it worked just as beautifully there at the other school. All right, let's get started. I wanted to start. I, I feel like and I don't I, I don't mean this the wrong way. I feel like you buried the lead. And I, there was one of these slides that I was like, this needs to be the first thing because I hear this all the time from my wife, who's a middle school teacher. So let me throw my screen up. And for anybody who's just listening, feel free to jump onto YouTube and you should be able to see uh, everything. All right. So here's the big one. Um, how to middle school school students learn ages 10 to 12. Walk us through this. Well, we got to think back to the Piaget that we learned in college. They are so concrete thinking. And I think this is even more and more true now than maybe say eight or 10 years ago. I don't know why exactly, but um, they're so literal. When you say one thing, they're going to literally perceive it. They're some, and then in middle school, some are getting into the abstract in the formal operational stage before the others are, you see the growth spurts. It's, it's such an amazing time in their life. Um, they do have difficulty in the abstract, which is why sometimes solfege, if it's if it, solfege is introduced, you know, in this age range, sometimes it doesn't make any sense to them, to some mm -hmm. of them. They're also lacking fine motor coordination. Oh, my goodness. They're awkward. They're clumsy. They can trip over a shadow there. <laughs> and here's the big takeaway. They're very self-conscious, especially yep. these days. Um we won't get into what social media is doing to them, but they are very, very <clears throat> conscious of how people are perceiving them. They need lots of repetition. And I think one of the things that a lot of us do wrong without realizing it is we talk too much. Definitely. And uh, so, and you need to refocus them back. You know, if the bell rings, if a person walks in, if the phone rings, you got to keep refocusing. Focusing, refocusing. So many people think that high school and middle school are so much more similar than they are. The kids, no. are, the kids are so different that it's really important that people who teach middle school understand how kids are. You know, you're talking about um, being very literal. Um, like my wife talks about how to teach dynamics. You can't just say, mm -hmm. hey, play this emotionally to a middle no. school kid. That doesn't work. You need to say, how about we get louder for this part and then we get softer for this part. Or you have to be very direct or else they don't understand it. Yes. I even color code now. So if I want them to uh, be louder, we got orange highlighters. And if I want them to be softer, we do green highlighters. And I assign it a number. Mm -hmm. because back to numbers. Numbers make sense to them. But yeah, you're right. All right. So let's kind of go through the, the 
the lineage of how you do this. We're going to start with um, instrument matching. Um, and I did want to say, if anybody hasn't heard it, I forget what episode it was. It was in the 80s, but my wife and I did an episode with Larry Jackson about beginning band, and they talked a lot about, we talked a lot about of these similar things as well. So if people are really digging this and they want another one, go back and find that one. All right, well, instrument, you know, instrument matching. During COVID, a lot of us gave it up, and we just, we figured there was no way to safely pass instruments around or have them try them. Yep. Uh, and some of them were online anyway, you know, you're trying to do it over zoom. I did oh, that. Miserable. And, um, and I, I just want to encourage people if you've given it up and then like you never went back to doing this, I encourage you to do it because the kids want to be good so badly. It, they're terrified of being embarrassed in front of their friends or, you know, so it's it's well worth the time and the effort to set them up for the success. It only takes me, you know, I have 40 in a class. It only takes me like uh, uh, five to eight days to do this. And it's well spent. And so basically what what you're doing is trying to find what kids would be good at for instruments. So you can yes. recommend what instruments they'd be best at. Yes. Do you so want here, me to talk individually about this? Yeah, let's do the targets that we have on front here. Well, mainly the flutes. If a yeah. child cannot produce a sound on the head joint within, say, 10 minutes of trying in a mirror, I just hand head joints out yeah. and I stick them in front of a Dollar Tree mirror and I show them what they're supposed to do. And then I just lay, I leave them alone over there while I help another kid. And if they, if I hear two, 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 if they're getting it, then I, I can put a plus down on the card for them. Sure. Um, but if they can't, they're going to, there's nothing that's going to make it magically happen. I'm afraid to say when I, I was new at this, I would have flute players in the second month, third month, still not yep. making a sound. That's, that's just not right there. I would, I would, I know sometimes for us, we've had the occasional kid who's really invested in the flute and yes. they really want to do it. And then if, if, the, if you, if their parent knows they're a hard worker, sometimes they can work through that, but it's definitely the exception. I have one right now, actually. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She's, she's, she's getting it. The yeah. others, um, the others are kind of self-explanatory, except sure. I would say that the oboe, everybody thinks, Oh, oboe and bassoon. Oh, you know, they're not that hard. They're not right. any more difficult than anything else. But what you need is the personality of an independent learner. I had sure. a kid who just right away, he comes up to me, Mrs. Zins, I want the most unique instrument you have. He knew that from the start and he did take the oboe. Yep. Because yeah, they're I, probably going to be the only one in the class. Yeah, a kid who's okay doing their own thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, the brass, if they can't make two, at least two pitches on the, you know, on the open horn after time. Now, I don't mean you just hand it to them for a few seconds. I let them go, you know, go off to the side. I show them what to do, and then I send them off to go work on it. If If they can't do it, you don't give up yet, but you, you, uh, if they just really can't do it, you, we go to saxophone or something. Sure, sure. Do you do anything with their music audiation, their music IQ and their natural ears ahead of time? You mean, do I give a test? Yeah. I, in way back in my early years I did. And it, that was more to get them excited that they got the answers right. Yep. I didn't really yep. use the data for any Thing. Now for French horn, they've got to be able to sing with you. So I just start singing happy birthday. I say, sing with me. And I start singing happy birthday. And if they can latch on right away to my notes, then I know they can do that. If they're singing Gregorian chant with me, then maybe not so much. <laughs> so, you know, French horn is, is very, very difficult if you don't have that ear. Yeah. I think big picture, you know, if you have a kid who struggles with their ear, you know, the woodwind instrument, the reed instrument is really the best thing to do. Maybe euphonium, but you know, the brass instruments. Yeah. I think a, a lot of the struggles that I hear people have really refer to the fact that this kid maybe isn't matched with that instrument very well. Right. So now they get better at it and, you know, after their time in band, they get better at the audiation, but, uh, it's Great. good to match them to the one that they're going to get successful on right away. All right. So if you don't mind, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to what you do. So kids have chosen their instruments. Um, what you do while you're waiting for those instruments. Okay. 
Uh, unless okay. there's something, unless something I just skipped over that you really want to get to. Uh, not necessarily. Okay. I'm just I, interested in what, what you think is, are the okay. salient features of this. So, okay. um, while I just we're feel, waiting I just, for I'm just going to say, I just feel bad because you put all this work and I never want to skip anything thinking that it's not important, but I also right. don't want to go slide by slide. So, right. All right. While I'm we're like, waiting for instruments. Yeah. Um, I do a lot with rhythm. Okay. And, um, this is the heart chart here behind me. This is something that I came up with it when I was teaching elementary music. And it's just a beautiful, concrete, clear way of teaching rhythm. I use this in the band. And the, the this is a heart is a quarter note. And underneath is a rest. And it shows that a, the beat does not stop. The beat just goes silent. And one of the first activities we do is I take off these, I take off the uh, sep the eighth heart and they've already learned to, to uh, play their mouthpiece and neck or mouthpiece and barrel or whatever. And we're tonguing, 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 tonguing. And so ta, 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 then breathe. Now what that does is it stops this, what they always want to do. Ha, 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 mm -hmm. ha. Huh. You've got to stop that from the beginning or you'll never break the habit of the ha, ha, ha. Mm -hmm. So ta, 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 insist on it and activities like this. And then um, eighth notes. So I call this beat. These are called beat, 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 beat. And then this is beat and. Mm -hmm. And then you just place the beat and. Anywhere on the chart. And now you have beat, 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 and beat. We practice doing rhythms before they ever get their instruments to like this a lot. And then uh, one day I just say number the beats. And you mm -hmm. see the numbers at the top. So then yes, they yes. are one, two, three, and four. So this is a great tool. You can do the same thing just by writing, uh, you know, drawing this out on your board or whatever. Yeah. You know, but the same idea. Did you make that? I did. That's pretty sweet. You could sell those. I do. Oh, you do? <laughs> I've sold several thousand all over the world, actually. Wow. You have an Etsy shop? How do you sell it? Well, I, Don and I sell stuff. <laughs> oh, cool. But this isn't about that. Okay. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, is there a link where people can buy that if they want? Well, I'm... I'm trying to stop selling it. Okay. I've been selling this ever since my daughter was born 27 years ago. Wow. And I don't make any money. I mean, I just break even because this is incredibly expensive to make. This is sheet metal. This is vinyl. Wow. This is foam. And it comes with a whole set of notes as well. So one day you just, uh, one day the kids come in and you've got quarter notes here and eighth notes here. And it's the same exact thing that it's seamless. Oh, super cool. So anyway. Okay. A lot with tonguing, a lot with rhythm. Oh, and another thing uh, that's very valuable with a chart like this or something like this is have put, your, put different rhythms out on each line mm -hmm. and then assign a line to the kids. And this is before instruments. So these kids are going to play with their hand on the chair. So it's tap, 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 rest, tap, 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 rest. While these kids are going to take their pencil and tap on their music stand. So ting, 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 mm. ting. You've got a little ensemble happening here. Okay. And then what if we go like, um, let's do clapping hands. Clap, 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 clap. And then maybe this is... Um, Stomping. They can vocalize it. You know, so you've got four different things going because you got to get the kids used to hearing multiple things going on in the band room while they're trying to attend to their their sure. part. So using a chart like this as a score and building a rhythm ensemble and developing it even more, maybe into an eight beat pattern or a 16 beat pattern and having it just go, go, mm -hmm. go, and let them get used to following a beat, playing together, staying together and listening. That's so cool. I love that. That's so cool. I want to do that with my high school band. They, they would love it. Yeah, I'm sure they would. 
Um, on here, we have some resources um, that you use from YouTube. I'm just kind of scrolling through here. Um, things to avoid while you're waiting. Yeah, um, I know sometimes band director, middle school band directors like, okay, well, I've got a week until the instruments get here. What do I do? You know, well, they, they think right away, they think music theory and they start like, uh, I don't know, pencil and paper, but why did kids sign up for your class? Did to they, did they want it to be like all their other classes where they're using pencil and paper and books and getting grades and all that? No. So I discourage that because now theory is great, of course, but if you teach it out of the context of their instrument, it's not really going to stick. And yep. the same thing with treble clef. A lot of times they start doing the every good boy does fine and they, you know, all kinds of worksheets on that. And let's spell words with the, with the uh, seven music notes, egg and, you know, but the tuba player is not even going to see those notes. Right. And, and the flute player is going to be at the top of the treble clef. And so it's like you're, you're, accenting just this narrow range why don't you just wait yeah get the instruments out and then start doing things particular to their instrument you're gonna all, yeah. time well spent it's also kind of boring yes yeah. yes agreed this is more fun yes rhythm yeah. ensembles is a whole lot more fun definitely definitely fun so um let's scoot ahead to what you do what you do to prep the instruments okay this saves so much time. So on the flutes, I have little, I just go to Dollar Tree, love Dollar Tree. Do y'all have Dollar Tree? Yeah, we do. Okay, love Dollar Tree. So just little circles. I haven't done it to this flute, but I would put one here, here, and here on the right hand notes. And I would put one, this is the tricky hand, of course, here, here, and here, because you're skipping one. These yep. are just little colored circles. And then one on the back. Now, something else I started doing is a little marker here to show that right hand thumb because what happens, they want to hook the flute and hold it like this, yep. and then they never get good hand yep. position over here. But if they pull that back and touch the little marker, I like to use a Velcro circle, something they can really feel. Mm -hmm. And I also put one over here, you know, that funny place where the flute sits, mm -hmm. put it right there. And then the, if they feel it, I tell them to feel that and then they're in the right place. OK, this is like probably the biggest. Yeah, uh, the biggest advantage to, to take the time to do this. Yeah, and I yeah. also put a little Velcro thing on the trumpets to make their right hand thumb in a in a good place instead. of They want to hook it as well. Mm -hmm. um, I I always pull the tuning slides on all the brass so that they're not used to hearing a very high pitch. Um, it, it gets them close. Of course, they're not in tune, but it gets them it gets them closer to being in tune and hearing everything down around the 440. Mouthpiece patches on the clarinets and saxes. I do the same thing to the saxophone fingers uh, because... Uh, and these are just cheap little stickers that come off, and it's okay that they come off. Because mm -hmm. you don't need them after a week anyway. Um, that trombone placement is tricky. So I take some electric tape and go around the slide right here. And I mark the places where they're supposed to be touching here. And then uh, the bell kit. I give them one note. It's the F. All the rest, they, they don't get to cheat. <laughs> Don't forget to check those instruments that they brought in that grandma played in high school because, mm -hmm. you know, something could be missing there that you need to uh, address before the first day when they're all excited. Totally, totally. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I just love the, 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 the sticker thing. I think that's huge. When I heard people started doing that. How long have you been doing that? Oh, 15 years. 15 years, yeah. It's that, that time, everybody who I talk to about it thinks that time and effort they put in is so well worth it. Oh, a minute ago, you had the slide up that said, don't, don't allow the instruments to go home. Yep. I can get that before, up. Before, you know, they're so excited. They, they rent the instrument down here. We have rental nights. Sure. 
and that, you know, the parent does the contract in the first payment and then the kid wants to take it home and right away take it in the yard, uh, you know, have brother and sister mess with it and everything. And then they bring it back for their lesson and it's broken. So I have always just paraded them into the instrument storage room and they put them away on the shelf or the locker and it just stays there until uh, it's our first day of everybody getting the instruments out together. And that that's when I do all of this sticker stuff is because they're in there anyway. So I have about a week where I can do a few. And then once they can play three, three to five notes, a three note song, I know their embouchure's right. I know their hand position is good and they know how to sit up correctly and they can really sound like they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's when the whole class gets the okay to take them home. And that, I tell you one thing you don't really think of, it makes such a better impression on the parent. When the parent hears their kid in the bedroom playing a, a real song instead of just all these horrible noises, you know, and, and the parents going, wow, I've made a good investment. This was mm-hmm. really great. Instead of going, what have I done? <laughs> so <laughs> that I, I'm a stickler with that. And I have only had one parent who didn't understand my madness there. Um, so as you start them on the first day, for you, it's about the third week of school. Yes. Um, let's talk about some of the tips. I see these tuba players sitting on the floor. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's their first time ever holding the tuba. So I figure if they drop it, it's only going to fall a little (laughs) ways down. So, but yeah, they, I take turns and they go down on the floor and they, they, uh, assemble on the floor for day one. All right. What about some, what about some tricks for putting on reeds? Well, if you if you put the ligature on first, slip it up and then slide the reed in, you're mm-hmm. going to protect the tip of the reed. Yep. Because it, it, here the damage happens when you put the reed there and then here comes the ligature, you know. So Sure. And you got to be careful with these ligatures. I have found in my uh travels around to other band rooms, I do almost always find someone's ligature is backwards, upside down, or wrong, or wrong size. And it's important. The ligature uh, doesn't have to be expensive, but it has to be on correctly so that Mm -hmm. the reed can vibrate correctly. I've talked to people who, who have it upside down, and they swear by it upside down, and they give me all the reasons why, and I'm like, well. (laughs) <laughs> Some of them are made to be upside down. And I experimented in college too with just taking a regular one and turning it upside down. But you can tie it on with string like they did in the old days. Doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's start with this, their first note. Um, okay. Yeah. And so after we've done all that mouthpiece and, and ta-ta-ta and learning to articulate and learning how to go through, blow through a phrase... Now I'm actually putting the instrument all the way together and placing their fingers. So, and I don't tell them that it's concert F. I tell them it's, well, I might mention it's called concert F, but I'm saying we're gonna call it note number five so that so that all around the room, we can say five and everybody knows what we mean and it's gonna match, even though his is called this and his is called that. Now, um, continuing to practice the articulations instead of adding notes because the articulations and being able to form that embouchure and get a good sounding tone without tension Mm -hmm. is more important than getting to the five notes. Well, they want to get to the five notes. They can take them home, but you have to rein them in, you know, now this, uh, this just came to me one day, the four corners concept, because I'm, they were so, confused about the the concert pitch thing so i actually made them go stand in the four corners of my room there's a concert pitched corner there's a b flat corner there's an f corner with just your french horns and then there's Mm -hmm. the e flat corner and and i tell them okay you, you guys over here in this b flat corner this is kind of unusual there's a trumpet there's a clarinet there's a tenor sax there's a bass clarinet what do you have in common that your five is all called G. 
It's the name of your note. And it has to do with how your instrument was built. And then, you know, I tell each one of them. Then after they have physically stood in the four corners for my little explanation, mm -hmm. they sit back down. But then I refer to those four corners for the next two years. And, but I don't. they don't have to go stand. I just say, if this is your corner, can you look at um, this note right here? And then, uh, you know, and it just really helps. Sure. Again, it's a physical, literal thing that concrete. you can do to connect to concrete. <laughs> yep. Right. Okay, so then you add three so that you can play Soul Me songs. Right. And that's universal around the world that... Uh, so many songs. Yeah. Um, and now in this situation, like I gave this example, that's a clarinet part. And I can tell the kids, okay, everybody in the room is going to play off this clarinet part. It doesn't matter what the notes are. Just look at the ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then they can see, they can see and hear the up and the down, the up and the down. And you could do it even without the visual. If you wanted to use the hand signs, mm -hmm. this is awesome. So wall, floor, wall, floor. And, uh, you know, ha do a little pattern and have them echo you just by the hand signs. And even if you are not fluent in solfege, I'm not. We can all do so in me. Mm -hmm. Okay, now here's the fun part. Now you're going to create with the kids on the board. Okay, so... They know one, two, three, four, five. And this, I call this ORF inspired arranging. ORF arrangements are very elemental. That's the way Carl ORF wanted it to be. And they're very ostinato based so that kids can latch on. They're typically pentatonic, but mm -hmm. some, some are one, five harmonies, which helps us uh, with some of the things that are in the band book. Everybody learns all the parts. That's an ORF process teaching uh, concept. Sure. And the students have input into it so that when you're teaching an ORF class, say you're teaching the same lesson to 10 classes, you're going to get 10 different outcomes because the kids get to decide the form. The kids get to decide who's playing the timbres and everything. Now, so this would really be me handwriting on the board Mm -hmm. I've never re had it prepared in advance like this because I wanted to be more organic with me, like making it happen in the, on the spot. So three, two, one, three, two, one, da, da, da. And I get them to play this from the numbers right away. They played a song. Then we introduce harmony. So I just call it plus two harmony. Again, I'm talking about basic math. Plus yeah. two harmony is the red. So everybody learns the red, everybody learns the black, and then I split them up. Some, some sections play the red, some sections play the black, and their eyes get big because mm. now they hear harmony and it sounds good. Then we introduce the concept of the bass line. Can I just pause so, you? Can I pause you real quick? Yeah. The, the plus two harmony thing is fascinating. I've never heard that phrase before. That's genius. <laughs> I love it. That just came to me one day too. Um, oh, I love it. Well, so you look at it, then, you look at, you look at the numbers. You're like, well, that's easy. You know, again, easy. it's just a way of making it easy. Exactly. I love it. I love it. That's kind of what I'm, I major in is finding ways to make things easy. Mm -hmm. um, so now we, the green is the baseline and it's just usually just ones and fives, which is great because you put your low brass playing that and they're working their embouchure. And they're they're changing those partials. This sounds even better. And mm. then if you can put a little a little rock beat with it, um, if you can play the rock beat on the drum set or have you know or have a little recorded one or whatever, it sounds so cool. And then have the students create an introduction. And I you know you want to make sure that the introduction has something to do with the song. Mm -hmm. So. You teach them how do composers think of their introduction? How do we want to end it? And do we want it to go like clarinets first and then the all the woodwinds? And so they come up with a form. I just love this creative process so much more than playing whole notes and whole rests out of the band book. Sure. So a question that I have for you, um, if this is a main thing that you're doing with the class and you say you have them for what, 42 minutes, obviously some of that is going to be pack up time and some of it's going to be get out the instrument time, especially as they're younger. 
Um, do you find that there's certain days where you have to do something else too? Cause this, or does this take up your entire class for this? This whole could be session? the entire class because you can develop it, develop it, develop it, do it again and do it a different way. Change this. They, they really enjoy having mm -hmm. the input. Remember it's not math class. It's not history class. There's another advantage to having the numbers at your disposal. There's, there's quite a few. Here's one. I was listening to commercials and I hear, oh, 5533-1132. Five, five, three, three, one, one, three, I don't know if y'all have safe light windshields, but, and, and just little liberty, 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 liberty. And I convert things into numbers and I make these little sheets and they're going home and practicing uh, with their, you know, within earshot of their family, real songs, jingles, mm -hmm. popular music, familiar melodies. So it, it just expands their repertoire hugely. And there's another advantage. Even in the second year, third year bands, when you hit a tough spot, you know um, how hard it is to manage the room when you're working with like just the clarinets mm -hmm. and on a tough spot. Well, if, there, if you happen to be in concert B flat, you just go up there and you and you jot down the tricky part on the board in numbers. The whole band plays it. The mm -hmm. whole band plays along. And and as they're older, like eighth grade, they start understanding moving one. We start working on uh, changing one now. What if one, your old four becomes your new one? Now we're playing in E flat. Mm -hmm. And and it all makes sense if you kind of wait till they're ready for that. Right sure. there. That's great. And for people who, again, who are listening, I urge you to jump on YouTube. And so you can see, you can steal some of Lori's tunes as she's done the uh, transcribing here for you. But, uh, you know, it's, I would assume any, any tunes that come up, people can use and, and use that, that. There's um, probably ones I haven't thought of yet. Oh, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure. sure. It's, it's endless. Um, all right. So you've done lots of work and around the seventh week of school, and now we're dealing with notation with your method book. Yes. Um, I stopped asking parents to buy a method book years ago because I noticed by the end of the year, the, the books still were in great condition and mm -hmm. they were just going to never be used again. So I started collecting them from the kids and then um, just using a class set. Yeah. And that way, everybody has a book. Everybody has the right book. But so at this point, after they've done all of these ORF inspired arrangements, um, they are ready to go ahead and get into the book. Okay. So this is not the book that I use. This is a cheap accent on achievement. It just happened to be sitting here in my room, but they're all almost the same where they start off with a whole note and a whole rest and a whole note and a whole rest. Okay. So that's what this one does. And it starts on a three. So I just tell the kids, okay, look at line number one. This is what everybody's three looks like. Mm -hmm. And, oh, clarinets, yours is on the bottom line. Oh, tenor saxophones, yours is on the fourth space. Oh, let me say this. Um, before we got instruments, one of the things we did is we drew music. We copied. I gave them printed music, and they drew every detail they could draw and copied it. So that just brought their awareness of where are the lines and spaces? Where do how does that note sit on that line? Because I just drew it. It just mm -hmm. it heightens their awareness. So they now when I say, "Oh, you're on the bottom line," or "You're on the fourth space," they know what I'm talking about. And then in this book and and mine too, I think they go to um, then it goes to a four, and then it goes to a five, and then it starts mix, mixing fours and fives. I think they all do this. Mm -hmm. And then on the the second page. There's a duet and they've already played ensembles too. When we did heart chart activities, they knew about ensembles and duets and things. So my kids basically could get through the first two pages of the book in one class period on their first try um, with all, with the background that they've had up to that point. Yeah. They're going to go so much faster because of everything that they've oh. learned. When I used to teach, you know, book and instrument all on day one, and you're running mm. around placing fingers, placing fingers, correcting, correcting. It, this is so much freer. So a question, when you start with five and then three, um, when you have your flute players who are going from F to D, yep. um, 
that's that's a pretty hard fingering pattern for them to be starting with. What are some tricks besides choosing the right kids? Is there anything else that you use <laughs> to help them? Because that's a that's a huge tactile thing. Yeah, seesaw. If they even know what a seesaw is, a teeter totter. <laughs> okay, seesaw. And the one good thing about the the uh, five to three on the flute is that it's not. You know how when they go to the C, they're going to drop the flute. It's it's still a very stable two notes. Yep. You don't feel like you're going to drop anything, but that's just. That's just repetition of seesaw up, down, up, down. So then when you, when you add four, then you deal with don't drop the flute now. (laughs) Yes. Now we deal with that and you just push it towards your, push it towards your face with your waiter hand. This is your waiter hand and this is your nice hand. Okay. Now, once you've gotten into the book, now we, we pretty much stay in the book. You know, we do the book every day, not the entire time every day, but um, now uh, we finish the book. I know that a lot of directors, once they get to a certain point in their method book, they have told me that they don't need the book anymore and they just do sheet music. Well, if you do that, your low brass players are now doomed to playing roots and fifths mm-hmm. and no interesting parts for the most part. It, a, a melody line is going to be rare. But if you stay in the book all the way to the end and second year do a second book and third year do a third book, then you give your all of your musicians a chance to play melody every day. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, just a question. When you're talking about method books, I just did an episode with Tiffany Hitz. Um, and she talked about using a bunch of different method books and things like that. Do you have any that you like particularly? Well, I'm old school. When I first started uh, teaching band way back in the 80s, I went to a workshop by Ed Sweta, senior. Okay. Yep. And um, it he was fabulous, so practical, and uh, started using his books back then. And then when I taught elementary, he also has a recorder method that almost parallels the band book. Hmm. And then when I went back to band, he had come up with his premier performance, which is just a little bit snazzier uh, version of his old book, which was, which was just called the Ed Sweat band method. So what I use now and that, you know, they're all, they're similar, but I don't pay, I don't want, I don't need the color. And I don't need the connections to art history and who was president in 1850 and who, Mm -hmm. you know, all the distractions that they have now and take this test and write in the book. So um, Ed's book um, is just black and white. And every time there's a new concept, I don't have one here with me, but every time there's a new concept, there's a square at the top of the page. There it is. They raise their hand. This is Ed's, what is this? And I say, look at the top of the page. There it is. Um, so I use his premier performance, book one, it's blue. But then for book two, I go back to his old one, his original method book for mm-hmm. book two, it's green. And then I come back to his uh, premier performance, book three for my third year players. It's just like sight reading. It's glorious Hmm. it's not exercises so much anymore it's classical tunes folk tunes um it's jazz thrown in there and it's just it really is a great sight reading book and giving everybody a chance to play a cool melody i think it's just so important as people are teaching and this is not just a middle school thing but if you have these texts that you like you know you if at any point you want to change, feel free to, but if there's something that works for you and you know, and you're comfortable with teaching it, do it, you know, and, and, you know, you might teach from a different one as somebody else, but as long as it works for you and you can teach your students through it, I don't think there's any necessarily right or wrong. There's a lot of great books out there. So whatever works for you. All right. A couple of questions for you to uh, end our time together. Again, I want to thank you very much for you're back at school and I'm not. So I'm, you're, I'm, you're probably a little jealous of me, but um, yeah. so in, in, for a while, we were talking about student input, making these arrangements, these orph inspired arrangements before they were reading music. And uh, that takes a lot of discussion from the classroom, a lot of hands going up, a lot of suggestions. And I think asking a lot of people would say that asking middle school students, their, their thoughts 
is a very dangerous thing to do if you don't have complete control over your room. So any advice that you might have to teachers who are trying to deal with the classroom management side of things, as well as giving their students some autonomy in what they're learning? Well, the days of kids sitting in straight rows with their hands clasped on their desk and, you know, not talking, those are gone. Um, a noisy classroom is a thinking classroom. And as long as they are talking about what we're doing, I love that sound. That's that's glorious. Listen to them interacting about this music. Um, now, but you, yeah, you have to keep it moving. You have to have a plan. You can't just let it go, you know, total free. Like improv, people think uh, jazz improv is just totally free right. without a structure. But um, so it, you've got to have a plan and a confined structure and let them put their input in, keep it moving, use your body proximity. When you hear something's get, getting a little out of hand, just go on over there. And this works wonders. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Just lean over and ask them, what are you doing? They won't typically, oh, you know, I got a little out of control there. Um, I'm in a Capturing Kids Hearts model school here in Florida. And that's an amazing way to manage behavior. It's an entire philosophy and way of thinking, but it uses a social contract as well. The classes compose their own social contract of how they want to be treated and how they're going to behave and they all sign it. So that that's something to look into if, um, you know, someone's interested in improving their classroom management. If you love them and give them input and respect and never embarrass them, don't embarrass them. We have so many chances where we could embarrass them, mm -hmm. but choose Choose kindness instead, and uh, when you they will respond to you. You do need a signal to bring them back. If it's going to be a clapping signal, if it's going to be you standing on the podium, if it's going to be a whistle, I have my drum major whistle, mm -hmm. and I use that sometimes. Um, but yeah, some kind of signal to bring them back. But then when they hear their product, when you play the the little arrangement that they helped with. Um, they're sold. That's great. Thank you. Um, and the last question I had is um, any tips you might have for other band directors? And now this is always a really hard question to answer because we feel like if we're saying it, then we feel like we know it all and we're trying to tell somebody else and that's not the case, but you have so much experience and you've given us so many things to think about here. I mean, even as somebody who doesn't teach beginning band, I'm going to take a lot of this and, and hopefully use it. Um, so what's some advice that you might give to somebody else? Well, I, I pretty much have a constant stream of college interns. So I give feedback a lot and I'm asked to go mentor other teachers and go into their band rooms in our area here as well. It, it's, I have to say it's one thing. They talk too much. So you, with my interns, I have to train them. If they're going to say five sentences, no, say it in five words. Mm -hmm. And and here's the other thing. While the band's playing and you're listening and you're analyzing, you better have something already that you're going to say when they stop. Because uh, college kids, they will stop and then they will just stare. Mm -hmm. They'll just stare at the score. with And, and I'm like, well, okay, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do? It be, they've got to, you've got to always be thinking one step, at least one step ahead. And I think that's, that's huge. Don't talk so much. It, when they stop, if you don't know what to say, do it again. Mm -hmm. That was great. Do it again. Okay. And then think, then listen harder. If you didn't catch something the first time, then listen harder and come up with something to correct. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Growing Band Director. See you next week.